For 26 years, the rebels of Aceh have preferred to die fighting than call themselves Indonesians. They say Indonesia stole their land and their riches and they want it back, whatever the cost. This gun battle was filmed back in August. 2,000 people were killed last year, mostly civilians. This week, a peace deal was signed. But hatred runs deep. This is a vast and often violent land of 220 million people. A country torn apart by conflict. Now that East Timor has got independence, Indonesia faces separatist revolts in Papua, over in the far east of the archipelago, and in the far northwesternmost tip of Sumatra, Aceh. That's where we're heading. For years, the government has tried to keep the rebellious province of Aceh unreported. Its forces stand accused of having waged a dirty war of rape, torture and execution. But after the Bali bomb, the Indonesian authorities gave me a journalist visa. I used it to go to Aceh. The provincial capital seemed peaceful enough to begin with. Outside the local parliament of government appointees, people were demanding an end to the bloodshed. Aceh is rich in natural gas and other resources, but little wealth has reached ordinary people. That's one reason so many have wanted to turn their backs on Indonesia and go it alone. The character of the demonstration has changed quite dramatically here, from a simple demand for a ceasefire to these people shouting for independence and freedom for Aceh. A world away in Geneva, the government was talking to the rebels, but independence wasn't on the cards. And they want to see our letters to show that we're legally here, but we're being kicked out. In Aceh, poverty mingles with memories of past glories. For centuries, Aceh was a rich, powerful, and fiercely independent sultanate. A golden age, now written out of Indonesian schoolbooks. Any perceived threat to the unity of the Indonesian nation has always been firmly dealt with. This is Jufri. He's a very brave but very worried man. Two years ago, when he was helping resettle Achenese refugees, a soldier came up to him and smashed him in the face with his rifle butt, breaking his cheekbone and his jawbone. They then stripped him naked and shoved him in a darkened room for 48 hours. Jufri said his experience was commonplace. That's why he'd become a counselor for victims of human rights abuse. He took me out of town into an area largely controlled by the rebels. Roadside sentries watched for Indonesian army and police patrols. Jufri is not a member of the rebels, but his work highlighting abuses by the security forces was dangerous. He was receiving death threats almost daily. Three of his colleagues were murdered last year. Jeffrey's explaining to all of these people that the outside world needs to know what's been going on in Aceh, but they're a bit scared to talk, and he's trying to set them at their ease and saying, don't be frightened, talk from your heart and tell us your stories. And they did. Abdullah, rice farmer, shot in both legs by an army patrol without warning, just feels anger, hatred, he says. Ralia, bullet through the knee while harvesting in a paddy field. Already widowed, now unable to work. Fatima, her daughter. It's hard for us now, she said. Sharifa, village school teacher. And her 21-year-old best friend, Eka. Both mothers of fatherless children. Sure, soldiers got jumpy patrolling in rebel territory, but terror like this was hard for these people to forgive. Shared pain had strengthened their feeling of being Achenese rather than Indonesian. Well, these two, and two, two more incredibly sad stories. Sharifa here, her husband had gone to the coffee shop and uh, the mobile police came past and just shot him dead at noon. And Eka here, 
she went to her mother's house one night. When she came back in the morning, and she was pregnant at the time, her husband had disappeared. That was eight months ago, and he's never been seen since. The child's since been born. Assalamu alaikum. Jonathan. Some just go numb inside, shut down completely, like 27-year-old Dharma Wadi. Hmm? OK, well, that's a classic case of fire first, talk later, or in this case, talk not even at all. This man was coming back from having collected firewood, was walking across a paddy field, and a mobile foot patrol of soldiers saw him, just shot him down. He was shot twice in one leg and um, it won't heal, he says. Last year, the Indonesian president apologized for human rights abuse in Aceh, but it didn't stop. So they're just bringing these people in from villages around and about to meet us because they just want to show us just how bad this is. These are ordinary villagers, farmers, just being mown down. We'd been there two hours. One man had warned me that if soldiers entered the village, we should drop everything and run like hell. Thankfully, it didn't come to that. I'd heard that in the countryside, few families had been left untouched by violence. I couldn't help feeling that even if peace were to break out tomorrow, these wounds might never heal. Another day, another demonstration. This time, farmers were demanding the government do something about poverty. This place had the feel of a very unhappy colony. We pulled up just short of police headquarters. We think we may have been able to negotiate our way in to see the British academic Leslie McCullough, who's held in the police station just down here. She was arrested six weeks ago for violating her tourist visa. One of the things that she said, which really riled the Indonesian authorities, was that in their own imaginations, most Achenese are unlikely ever to belong to Indonesia. In their minds, they'll always be elsewhere. Dr. McCullough is a university lecturer, an expert on Asia, and an authority on Aceh. No journalist had talked to her since she was arrested at knife point by the army. Her jailer, the commissioner of police for Aceh province, wanted to talk to us. He showed me prosecution documents, printouts from Dr. McCullough's laptop. She'd insisted these documents were for academic research. He disagreed. If she'd really been a tourist, he told me, she'd have been lying on a beach. A photograph. It's a stone bench, apparently splattered with blood. Dr. McCullough, he said, claimed the army used it for torture. I tell you the truth, he said. She's lying. It seemed we had persuaded the commissioner to let me in to meet Dr. McCullough. He'd made much of the free press in Aceh, but there were certain questions he did not want me to ask. So this is the, this is the office in which she's held. It's not a prison cell. It's an old office without a window inside the police headquarters. Dr. McCullough and the American nurse she was arrested with could face five years in jail if convicted. Their trial resumes next week. So, Leslie, look, what's really important here is that we've been told to stick to a very, very strict list of seven questions, which I've already given him. Mm -hmm. It does not leave room for maneuver, mm -hmm. and I believe that some people's safety is at risk if we, if we mm -hmm. diverge from that. Yeah. So, the, the first question that, that I had on my list to ask you is, why were you arrested? We were stopped in a sweeping operation by the army. We were arrested because um, we tried to protect our bags. They tried to open them without our permission. And it, it, we got into a fight with them, basically. Um, and they brought in some uh, Bree mob, some of the mobile police brigade, and things turned pretty ugly. And we were taken away to a local police station. Okay. Okay. The police chief constantly interrupted. Hurry up, he said. Get on with it. Leave me a minute. Um, the next question is, has your experience here changed your views? It's only confirmed um, my suspicions and what I already knew based on previous research and concrete evidence that I've gathered over several years. And it's made me more angry on behalf of the Achenese.
and what happens to them here in Aceh. If you had the opportunity to make a statement mm -hmm. to the Indonesian government, mm. what would you wish to say? They must listen to what the Achenese want and what they're doing is heightening by pursuing a military or security solution here, is heightening the sense of fear, the victim and revenge mentality that is perpetuating the problem here. Yes. Okay, so look, so he took notes on what they said in that interview and they're just checking out the past the commander here. Some say Dr. McCullough got too close to the rebels. Others suspect she got too close to the truth. Every human rights report I'd read about Aceh said the police and the army tortured those suspected of links to the rebel free Aceh movement or GAM as it's known. It's quite late in the evening and we've just received a telephone tip-off that six young men suspected by the police of being members of GAM and accused of planting a bomb have been released from police custody after several days. The lawyer wants us to come and meet them. Well, as you can see, the injuries suffered by these men are pretty severe. They're all terrified for their lives. We've had to conceal their identities because there are many cases in the past of people being picked up again by the police and beaten again. Could he tell us what actually happened? He was beaten. And how, how long did this go on for? Ten days. Okay, this, this guy was beaten for ten days with wooden blocks, rifle butts, and bits of steel, metal, yeah? And um, burned by, by cigarettes and dripping plastic. And he was blindfolded throughout. This was in interrogation. They had all been accused of being members of GAM, having been found sleeping in a mosque in a town called Loksamawe. Indonesia has signed the United Nations Convention Against Torture. But a recent UN report was damning. In Aceh, it said, the police and the army not only tortured, but did so with impunity. OK, we're sitting here waiting for a meeting with Johnny Yusuf, the commander of the army in Aceh. The interesting thing about him is that he's an Achenese himself. He was appointed to win hearts and minds. This is the general just coming now. He's in command of around 25,000 troops, maybe more, who are up against perhaps 5,000 GAM guerrillas. Good to meet you. I was invited for curry lunch in the officers' mess. Karaoke was on the menu too. General Jali Yusuf liked to lead from the front. He has such a lovely voice. Shadia, my Achenese guide, was in full agreement. As the general crooned, the gossip was about war and peace. Word was the Americans were leaning on the government and the rebels to do a deal. Outside the officers' mess, there was still a war going on. The general wants to take us down to the town of Lok Samawe, which is where Exxon Mobil is based. We were headed for the gas fields that make Aceh such a valuable prize. If I'd gone by road, I'd have hit dozens of checkpoints, which, even with my journalist visa, could have spelled trouble. But luckily for me, the general wanted to visit his garrison, and I now had a high-level military escort. Below, just paddy fields and poverty. No hint of Aceh's wealth down there. You wouldn't have guessed that this place was actually rich. The general seemed relaxed enough. The rebels in Lok Samawa had only managed to shoot down one army helicopter. The garrison town loomed out of the monsoon, Exxon Mobil facilities clearly visible. I set out in an armoured Land Rover for a tour of the gas pipeline. 
Last year, GAM forced ExxonMobil to shut down operations for four months. Now, more than 3,000 troops guard the complex. In America, a human rights group has filed a lawsuit accusing ExxonMobil of doing nothing to halt troops killing, torturing and raping local villagers. The company denies this allegation. It says it strongly condemns human rights abuse. Back at the garrison, flags flew at half-mast. A soldier had just been shot dead by the GAM. I'd heard whispers a new offensive was underway, designed, I presume, to concentrate mines at the peace talks in Geneva. General Jali Yusuf had finished meeting his commanders. It was my chance to question him. General, during your time commanding the troops here, um, very serious human rights abuse was documented. There was documented torture, rape, disappearance, murder, and some human rights groups say that that continues to today. What, what's your response to those allegations? As an Achenese, the general has to watch his back. He has many enemies, even in the army. Well, very frank answer there. The general admitted to the fact that there have been human rights violations in the past and even that they continue today, but he says it's just not like you hear on the news. There aren't any disappearances. I don't send my soldiers into the field and order them to do that sort of thing. He says the human rights groups are using the ExxonMobil thing to their advantage and they've got their own agenda. There's an anti-army propaganda thing going on, he says. They're accusing us of being in their pay. Frankly, he says, I can speak to you with a clean heart. I want to secure Aceh. And he said, basically, there will never be a separate Aceh. But if this is what life would be like in a secure Aceh, it's a frightening vision. I was invited to join the general's convoy as he made a personal detour deep into rebel-held territory. Unlike most of his troops, who come from all over the Indonesian archipelago, the general grew up in an Achenese village. He's a son of the soil, as they say here. Now, he was on a private pilgrimage to his father's grave. There'd been no big welcome, but this unhappy homecoming was his way of asserting that he wouldn't be intimidated by the rebels with the graveyard perimeter of his home village staked out by edgy soldiers, I reckon the general knew in his heart that he was far from winning the hearts and minds of his people. Before I'd left the UK, I'd been in contact with the GAM rebels. Now I'd got the green light. Back in GAM territory, I covered up in case we ran into the police or the army. I'd programmed in the general's mobile number just in case. OK, we've had a big change of plan. We were going to go down and meet some of the GAM leaders down in the Exxon Mobile area, but we had a message from them earlier to say that they've come under heavy and sustained attack from the Indonesian military and they can no longer accommodate. A small boat appeared out of the half-light we were to be taken somewhere else. I had no idea where we were going or who we'd meet when we got there. We were warned to be careful what we filmed. The plan was to keep us in the dark, literally. Be safe, someone said. Inshallah, I heard from behind me, God willing. We're, we're belting along in a speedboat here, in dead of night. We're getting very wet in the process. I think it's about a half hour ride into the GAM base to which we're heading. In the event, our trip took a lot longer.
Okay, we're, we're floating around here about a kilometre or so offshore and uh, we've cut the engine and the boatman and the GAM gorilla who's with us has just been radioing into the village to see if it's safe for us to go in now and we're waiting for the all clear. Guided by flashlights, our boat reversed over a reef through heavy surf. No moon, but from what I could make out, we were in a jungle camp, not a village. Men with guns ushered us into a clearing. I didn't get too misty-eyed about these rebel fighters. I knew GAM's own human rights record was open to question. Its guerrillas have killed informants, they've run extortion rackets, and have kidnapped for ransom. These young rebels had only ever known war. For all the talk of a possible deal in Geneva, hopes have been dashed so many times that the chances of peace seemed as remote as this jungle command post. The air was thick with the smell of clove cigarettes. On the boat, I'd overheard talk on the radio that there'd been a delivery of weapons that night somewhere along this stretch of coast. I asked if they'd been the recipients. No, no, they insisted, not us. The source of their weapons was closer to home. So what they're saying is that one of the main sources of the weapons that they have here is actually from the army, and some of them they, they capture, but others they... They, uh, they buy from them, and, and a lot of ammunition as well. And this gun here, um, they've just scrubbed the serial numbers off so that they can't tell. In fact, if you t on the other side, on this side, they've got their ASNLF. That's the Ache Sumatra National Liberation Front, which is the full name for the GAM. These are M16 bullets, and they say that these ones they can buy from the army for 3,000 rupiah, which is um, about... Uh, 30p. Not only do they get their guns and ammunition from the army, but they're, it's quite a useful way for them to get military training as well. But there are quite a number of Achenese who yeah, join the army, and they then defect back to the GAM once they've got the military training. We talked long into the night. It was Ramadan, the Muslim fasting month, and at 4 a.m. they served up fish curry and rice. This would be their last meal until the following evening. During the night, I'd expressed surprise at their willingness to be filmed. No problem, they'd said. We're dead anyway. But this week, the talks in Geneva have, in fact, produced a deal. Elections of the rebels hand in their guns. Self-rule, not independence. But no one's jumping for joy just yet. Listen to this 21-year-old platoon commander and you understand why. He says, we want to be free, we want to be independent, and we do not want to be occupied by Indonesia. He says, in matters of injustice, human rights, economy, all these things, we just do not want to be part of them, we don't feel part of them, and we are prepared to take any risk, even if we have to die for our dignity and for the people of Aceh. The Achenese rebels have done what countless others are doing across the globe. They've carved out an identity they believe offers a sense of belonging in a hostile world. It's why, as the 21st century begins, there are so many civil wars.